Anyway, dude, I have a freaking episode. Oh. Yeah, that wasn't the episode. <laughs> well, you said you weren't doing an episode, but I wasn't sure. No, okay. I got a freaking crazy one. Oh All my right. God, dude. Okay. So let's do this. This isn't Richard Ramirez. We're going to finish that up on Saturday, but I've been wanting to do an episode for a while. Now, this episode is dedicated to one of our good friends and supporters who I don't think is on here just yet, but this is dedicated to her and you'll see why here in a little bit. But oh my God. This- Are you not sharing her name yet? Uh, No, it'll become very evident really quick. Okay. But this is a crazy story, man. And I want to start this in Ponsford, Minnesota. So I have uh, never been to Minnesota. I'm pulling up the Googs right now. I have I'm also going. never been to Minnesota. So I'm, I'm going to do Halloween-ish episodes during the week just for you guys enlisted. And I don't know if Martin was on here last time, but yeah, I guess he was. But all the episodes from now on are going to be unlisted just for you guys. I think it's cool that because if I was supporting a podcast, I'd want to see, I want. I would want to hear my name shout it out all the time and see my name on the videos and stuff, you know. So having that unlisted for just y'all seems like a good idea. Anyway, this is where we're at. We're about to be. You said we're in Minnesota? Yeah. Minnesota. I think, uh, what killer was from there that we covered? Oh, I know who we covered that was from there. Who? That we don't even have the episode out. I need to do that episode again. The Which weep- one? The, weep- the weepy voice killer. Yeah. I just killed some. What was it? Oh, yeah. I just killed someone. I just killed two more people. What was it? <laughs> I'll give anyone two points right now. They can tell me that guy's name. I I actually think that was a trivia question of mine last week, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. All right. What was his name? I can't remember. Oh, I thought you remembered. Like, I remember the Weepy Voice Killer, but I don't remember the uh, thingy. Oh, look. Paul Bunyan State Forest. is. I guess he was from there. Paul Bunyan. Paul Bunyan is an urban legend, isn't he? Oh, fuck. I don't know. You tell me. With Babe, the big blue ox. Oh, yeah, yeah. So we're going to a couple places here. A couple counties. Itasca State Park, Ponsford, Minnesota, Wolf Creek, Shell Lake, all these little counties around here. This story is absolutely intense, and I I am so happy to do it. You guys are going to effing love it. I'm starting the winter of 1926, and we're in Ponsford, New Mexico. I thought we were in Minnesota. Oh, shit. I see New Mexico. Yeah. We're in Ponsford, Minnesota. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> wait, like, wait. Wow, we traveled far real oh, quickly. I basically dyslexied the two letters N M instead of M N. Oh. That's what I did. Got it, got because it. Because I was it, looking it. here in my notes and it says M N, so I'm dyslexic, maybe. So tonight sure. we're going we're going to Ponsford, Minnesota, and the surrounding counties. Winter of nineteen twenty six. There's a killer on the loose and there's a two hundred dollar bounty on his head. Now this is nineteen twenty six. So take a guess how much two hundred is in 1926. $2,000. It's actually pretty close. $3,000. Over $3,000. So around this time in the 20s, if you were to have a bounty on your head, as you'll see in like saloons or whatever. Thinking Red Dead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. you're, You're looking at the top being 500 maybe for the worst of the worst. Buffalo Bill or Billy the Kid or something. So $200 is, I mean, we're talking about someone who is a savage. Serious. Serious savage. From the Burlington Free Press, 27th of April, 1931, the following is a true story of a merciless killer, a monster that left a red trail of death and destruction in his wake. Mm. Paul Michael Stephanie, weepy voice killer, Martin says. <laughs> yeah, Stefani. Stefani. Did you know that without is looking Is he related it to Gwen? Uh, it is. No, I don't think it's spelled the same. Oh. Right? I think his has a P in it. Oh, P-H in hers is an F? I, I think so. I don't know. Man, I should do that case again. Yeah, that was pretty funny. It was very like... <laughs> <laughs> so we 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 actually recorded the case. I want to say like this was episode maybe twelve or it was something like, like that. It was very early, dude. and we like and at the get time through it for whatever reason. Like, <laughs> did we get too drunk? Like, and then we burned out, and you're like, I can't finish this. Something. Wait, like I didn't that. finish it. I don't think. No, it so. was a. It's a Supremo episode. It's on there. Is it? Yeah, man. Oh, you must have had to edit a lot of that out. I, don't think I, think I, I feel like this This was during, I mean, it was one of the times when it took us like five hours. You know what I'm going to do? Let, let me do this. Let me do this case. Oh, Okay, I'm going to do the case and I'm going to put in old clips of us doing oh, the case. My, oh my gosh, that would be so funny. <laughs> 
There's a little farmstead in this little Minnesota county, the home of Miss Miss Amundsen, Amundsen, Miss Amundsen and her husband Grover. Now, they're not a wealthy couple at all. She is a quote a frail city bred girl and on this night, she's actually home alone with the two kids because Grover actually works in the big city. And the dream for him and his wife is to own this little homestead with a farm attached. And he's about at the age of retiring anyway. So they went ahead and they made the purchase. And now they have themselves two children on this big farm. They have 40 sheep and lambs. They have one cow and one heifer doing pretty good. He hasn't quit his job yet, but he's he's going to after this night. So they were sleeping. It was wee early in the night. And all of a sudden, the kids jolt awake. There's this horrible sound outside where the farm animals are kept. All the lambs and all the sheep. It's horrible. It's it's screeching and squealing. Ah! It's agony. It sounds like it, it sounds like a mythical Goliath is just clawing these sheep and these lambs and these cows apart. They're terrified, terrified at this point. So when as soon as the day breaks, she goes out there and sees what was left. Oh dear. Out of their livestock, every single animal they have was mauled to death. That included 40 sheep. <gasps> and lambs, two cows, and one heifer, all mutilated, torn apart, ripped apart. As I said, this is a true story. So I'm going to show you in a little bit, not a farm animal, but a doe who encountered whatever this is. And the wound is, it makes you think of a giant with this huge hand, and he has these wolverine sharp claws, and he just right at the neck. And the neck is spliced open in like three or four different spaces, like one single blow. So imagine what all these farm animals looked like. Now, here's the thing. Whatever animals did this, they didn't consume any of the meat. Weird. Weird. Right? Because humans are the only animals that kill for pleasure. Uh, Martin says chupacabra. <laughs> but would, could that be a bear, though? You know, still? So- yeah, yeah. I mean, it could be a bear, yeah. But no, a bear. Why not? Because why would he, why would a bear go in there, kill all those animals, and then not eat? Do they always eat their vic- their prey? Yes. So humans are the only mammals that kill for satisfaction. Without, for with not for sustenance. But what about if they felt th- a threat? So you're saying a bear felt threatened by 40 sheep? <laughs> but, uh, maybe. I don't know. You know, I'm I am trying to come up with the logical possible answer here into what this may have been. Well, I'll reiterate again. This is 100% true story and historical documents back up everything I'm going to tell you. Well, you started out with there was a bounty on someone's head. So is this a person? A $200 bounty. So about $3,000 today, which then was a ton of money. And as I'll talk about, the state of Minnesota was so frightened and so pressured to get this killer apprehended that they started paying people just to go out and hunt for them. Not even if they if they bring them back. Because for years, livestock and animals and even hunters were mauled and left dead by whatever this is. Or a chupacabra or whatever. What did he say? Chupacabra? Chupacabra. That's a good guess. I don't know what that is. Is that, is that like a Yeti or something? Or a uh, Bigfoot, a Squatch? Um, I thought a, a chup. Maybe I'm thinking of something else. I, I thought it was like a lizard or something. Now, none of the meat was consumed. So at this point, okay, yeah, a pack of wolves. All right, the neighbors are called. Grover rushes home from the big city and consoles his wife and children who went through a night of pure hell hearing those 40 sheep scream and... uh, All night long. It was a massacre. He rushes home to console his wife and with him, sheriff and the neighbors, they check out the crime scene. Now, it is snowing at this point, so there are tracks, but it's weird because... Now the, like the sheriff, he's a trapper. Grover, he grew up. His his father was a trapper. They know how to they know how to track animals. But I don't know. Is this weird to you guys? There's only tracks from one animal, a single wolf. It's only one set of tracks because they can tell where the wolf turns and everything. It's a big effing wolf. Do you um you want to take a guess who I'm doing this story for? <laughs> Never mind. Wolfie. Yeah. <laughs> 
I like really had to think for a second. So neighbors are rallying around and trying to figure out what's going on. And about the same time, a, an Earl Ratcliffe, a young gentleman who, a strong young gentleman, he was working for the Duluth Log Company. He was a lumberjack and he was, he had just cut down a bunch of logs, fresh trees. They loaded them up on the cart and his job was then to drive them to the factory or excuse me, to horse carry them to the factory because mm-hmm. uh, I guess around these parts, they still use horses. I don't know. It's, it's only the 20s. Yeah. So so the horse, he put all the logs on this sled. Mm-hmm. The horses would pull it. So this man, Earl, is carrying these logs back with his horses. And he sees in front of him the mauled carcass of a doe. And he doesn't see the predator around there. But the horses sense because they, they can smell and they sense danger. Horses will nay and throw you off. They sense danger. And then they see this monster, what Earl describes as almost supernatural. It was too big to be a wolf. It was... A skinwalker? I feel like you're getting scared. (laughs) (laughs) This monster, this wolf, was in the middle of the road, and he was not going to let them pass. And he started snarling. (laughs) Oh, that was like a pig. (laughs) (laughs) How do you snarl? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> You're doing a lot of animal noises today, John. Wasn't that something we talked about trying to do an animal noise a day or an episode or something weird, like an impersonation? Oh, yeah. The horses smelling the fresh blood and seeing this snarling, bristling, terrifying creature in their path snorted and trembled in fear. When the, they were opposite the beast, he leapt. The horses bolted at the same time and the collar of the horse struck the wolf midair, sending him rolling in a swirl of snow. So we know this is a wolf, but Earl's by himself and that wolf seems like he wants to take a bite out of old Earl here. And the only other two animals at the scene were the two horses. And as you just read, they just, they started bolting. The lifesaver here is one of the collars on the horse smacked this big old wolf and threw him tumbling. At that point, this snarling wolf jumps up his fangs forward and he is rushing at Earl Radcliffe, rushing at him. Ah! Straight form, the horses are gone. Earl's toast. Earl gets thrown off balance. And on the ground, he sees from a sled that is now broken, a wooden stake that had came off. Because, you know, like the side, it was broken. Maybe the mm-hmm. the railing, it was broken. It was a, a stake. And he's on the ground. The wolf is about to jump on top of him. He grabs a stake. It's the only thing he has to defend himself. He swung it with all his might and he hit the beast. Wow. Mm. Lucky shot. Uh, The terrified horses fairly flew down the road with the wolf in full pursuit. As the beast drew alongside, Radcliffe hurled the heavy stake and struck the wolf in the side. This apparently discouraged him for he gave up the chase. What's weird here is a pack of a pack of wolves or even one wolf in general, they don't attack humans, they don't attack horses. So what they don't? is No, they don't. Well, they they do if they're either starving to death or well, maybe a horse, but definitely not a human. It's not like a wolf to directly go for a human. They'd rather go for easier prey. Got it. And if it does attack a human, it's usually a pack of wolves. The lone wolf thing is kind of a misnomer. It, it Yeah, it happens. But this is truly a lone wolf. Wolves run in packs, just like dogs, just like cougars, just like panthers, whatever. This one's a one-man wolf pack. This is probably the first case here where it's actually documented a lone wolf who is slaughtering farm animals across four or five different counties in Minnesota every night. Hmm. For fun. For funsies. That's what they're thinking. Now, the Native American population is, at the time, they lived all through the area. So, as you'll see from two of the trappers who are Native American, you'll read that they knew what this was. This wasn't a wolf. It was a spirit. This was something that walked the earth as a wolf, but then later retreated into the nether realms. This was a wolf now, but shapeshifts into whatever, a bird. They knew what it was. A skinwalker. 
sure. The Native American population, especially around this time, and, and if you look back in all their history, like the wolf is the thing. It's mm-hmm. always tied to mysticism. You see all those shirts with like the wolf, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's always tied to mysticism. Mm-hmm. But now it's it's documented here yep. as is proof. The government's hiring people to kill this thing, but it can't be killed. Now, let me go back to the Grover family. They lost 40 of their best animals, and a cow and a heifer. After this, Miss Grover, she fell into a terrible depression. For years, they have been saving up. Their dream was to own all this livestock. And not only that, but the the PTSD of hearing this traumatic clawing and this the the fear and the the screaming. She couldn't live it. She couldn't she couldn't live. She started deteriorating mentally. And the townspeople also thought she may have been cursed. Mm-hmm. But what I think it what it was is just her mind just shut down and she lost the will. Less than four months, she would be dead. Yep. No real cause of death, just grief. Neighbors around there say the disappointment of this heavy loss was too much for her. At any rate, she died less than four months afterwards. At this point, the husband drops his big city job. He is home with the wife until she passes and all the townspeople start noticing a change in him, Mm. but more of a a obsessive change. He is hell bent on killing this thing. He knows it's a wolf, a spirit or not, whatever. It could be killed. Mm -hmm. It is flesh. It is blood. It could be killed. There was saliva coming out of its mouth. It is it is something biological that can be slaughtered. And he is going to spend the rest of his life, if need be, chasing this wolf, living as a nomad, not even on his farmstead. He sends his two children back to Minneapolis, to relatives nearby in Minneapolis, and he ventures out. He lives in the, in the woods there, day in, day out, setting traps, poison traps. Sometimes he'll take a lamb and have like a bear trap or a whatever trap and put some lamb meat on it. He'll poison it. He'll put regular lamb meat around it to kind of, you know, so try to hide the poison. He would notice that this thing is taking the lambs out of the traps. The traps aren't being snapped, yet he's leaving the poison meat there. Like he knows somehow and he's toying with him. This creature is toying with this man who just lost his wife and everything. What do you think of this so far? It's pretty wild, actually. Yeah, I'm going to read the next one. This was from the Burlington Free Press. Amundsen sent his two children to relatives in Minneapolis and then, like many others, got on the trail of the monster. Weeks and months passed, his face became gaunt and hollow, and his eyes took on a wild, staring look. He ignored farmers' pleas to give up the chase, and eventually he went insane. Now, it says others. This is... I just pulled one random, the Amundsen family. Mm -hmm. Think about it. Like all these farmers lost everything. They're all out there now. Yeah. Now, some of them don't go as crazy as other ones. You'll see Grover went pretty crazy for, what does it say, weeks, months? Weeks and months passed after this event. And he was setting traps following this wolf, apparently, and he could never catch him. The wolf was toying with him. He would set trap after trap after trap. He would see the footprints of this wolf. They knew it was his footprints because they were huge. Mm -hmm. Way bigger than any wolf that has ever existed. Huge. That's crazy. And he saw in the snow that this thing, this wolf, this demon wolf was deliberately avoiding traps. He would set traps. Hmm. The wolf had gone for the bait as hoped, but he would never set off the trap. The wolf was smart, which you don't see ever. Nope. It's very supernatural. This wolf carefully tiptoed around each trap. At one time, Grover put a circle of bear traps around a lamb, and somehow this wolf didn't trip any one of them, but still got the lamb. From the Sporting Classics magazine, then, clutching the doomed lamb in his mouth, he began to retrace his steps by placing each paw precisely in his previous footsteps. That's fucking crazy. (laughs) Wow. This this demonic wolf. And let me tell you, this is true. This is a true story. This is crazy. This wolf is backing back out. No (laughs) animal can like know how to do that. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. No, it's, I mean. No. To know what that you have tracks. Yeah. Now, at this point, months have gone by. His wife is dead. 
He's lost everything. You know, he can't go back to his kids. They think he's insane. The town thinks he's insane, but they understand it at least. He's living as a nomad out there in the wilderness. He became obsessed with this deer, almost like Moby Dick. Which one was the whale? Was that Moby or Dick? Moby Dick was the person who the white whale. <laughs> <laughs> wait, no, 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 wait. Uh, Captain Ahab and Moby Dick is the whale. Sorry. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> Captain Ahab. He he became- Never a f- read it. Never read it either. So I don't know. Does he become insane? I, or I think of Jaws, right? Jaws was obviously pulled from Moby Dick. But Jaws by Peter Brentley. <laughs> that's who wrote the book. Uh, Martin says, animals can be very smart and aware of their environment. But you think they can like, they would know. I mean, obviously they can smell tracks. Like they know about track prints. But to be able to do that is pretty weird wild. I'm not saying that all the traps that he found were unclenched. I shouldn't say that. A lot of them had wolves in them. Just, just, not, this one. just not the wolf that was terrorizing the whole state. That's crazy. Because they knew what this wolf looked like because he had these big paws. The tracks, they're huge. This is a true story, man. This is crazy. <laughs> this is 100% true. Is it anyone else not picturing? <laughs> I cannot help but picture uh, this, this scene. Do you remember Beauty and the Beast? The movie, yeah. the cartoon, Bell. Like her dad was, you know, trying, like he left town and the wolves attacked his little stagecoach or whatever. I mean, I, I don't, I, I saw the movie like once. I remember the candlestick was something. Yeah, Lumiere. <laughs> and then the- B. Uh, guest. Guest. Be our guest. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, there you go. And then um, the one guy with the big muscles who would drink the eggs. Gaston. Gaston That's right. Egg. Gaston's your favorite. <laughs> Is he still your favorite character or do you have to go with... Uh... Yeah, that's the only one I know, really. Well, I didn't know if you were into Maui now, you know, from oh, Moana. Oh, uh, all the Disney movies? Yeah. yeah. Oh, Is um, he your favorite character of all the Disney movies? Um... Uh, I, that's a hard question. I don't know. No one fights us like Gaston. Mm. No, 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 no. Name some more Disney movies and, uh, um, I mean, the, the I really like Jasmine. Of course you do. Yeah. She's hot. And, <laughs> um, I don't know. I can't think of any other Disney movies. Okay. So Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, The Little Mermaid. Cause there's like, you know, Genie, you know, there's other yeah. characters. It doesn't have to be like the main, main folk. Um, well, I've never seen The Little Mermaid, so I don't know about that one. I haven't seen it. What the fuck? It's a classic. They actually that's just a, did a live, a, like a, a like a real, you know, live action one. That's and I a girl see it. movie, though. I want to be where the people are. Oh, my God. So good. Uh, I don't know. And uh, Mulan. I have never seen that. Oh my gosh, Mulan's so great. Is Eddie that, Murphy's in it. It's the one with the monster, the green monster. No. And the don- Eddie Murphy's the donkey or something? No, that's Shrek. Oh. Not Disney. That's not Disney? No. What is that? Pixar? Uh, Universal oh. technically owns it now. Mm. I don't know. What's y'all's favorite character out there? Anyway, yeah, this is a true story, man. So now months go by and Grover is about at the end of his last wit here. Mm -hmm. He decides to do one more thing. One more thing to try to trick this demonic wolf. What he's going to do, he's going to take a trap, just like always, and put all the other traps, just like always. So the wolf will be like, okay, yeah, let me step here, step here. Let me back up in my same paw prints. But this time he's going to bury one of the traps in the snow. Oh, shit. Shit. Pretty smart, eh? He's going to bury one of the traps in the snow. This wow. bear trap. We just played Resident Evil 4 where you <laughs> step in all these bear traps. Yeah. So, do you think it works? Mm-hmm. I'm going to assume, yeah, it works. So, I'm pretty sure I'm the only one who's ever covered the story. <laughs> I mean, I think I can safely say that. Why do you think so? Because who the hell has heard of this shit? Well, me. You've heard of no, it? No, I have not heard of it. That's what I was trying to say. Oh. Sorry, I've not heard of it, but... Has anyone heard of this? But Wolfie clearly has if she's requested this. No, she hasn't requested it. Oh, I thought she requested I this. I said I was dedicating it to uh, someone. I thought she requested it. No, she didn't request it. Oh. It was dedicated. How'd you find it then? I don't know. It's been on my list for a while. Mm-hmm. So, uh, where are we at? Martin, confirm nor deny. Has anyone covered this before? <laughs> uh, or have you requested this before? <laughs> All right, let's move on. He sets this trap and he buries one under the snow. It's kind of a Hail Mary, but let's see if it's going to work. In avoiding one trap, the cautious beast had planted his left forefoot directly into another. When Amundsen got there in the morning, the trap, stake, were all gone. The bits of wood scattered about told of how the wolf had chewed on the stake until it had loosened. 
With the dragging trap and stake making a plain trail in the snow, the wolf headed north. So he did step in there. Now, here's the thing. And I'm reading this from Becker County History. This is the county where this is happening. It has an exhibit about this, this wolf. Quote, when the farmer followed the tracks leading away from the scene, he found what was left of his lamb and the missing trap with a wolf paw still caught in it. The wolf had chewed off (gasps) his own paw to escape. Damn! From then on, old three legs could be recognized by the tracks he left behind. So this is the story of old three legs. What? A real life monster wolf who went on a killing spree, especially after this. And now all the farmers, when they go out and see the tracks, they're going to see two in the back and one in the front. Wow. He's only got three paws. One paw in the front, two in the back. Old three legs. Huh? Yeah, old three legs. Let's talk about this wolf's background. Sure. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. We we talk about serial killers all the time. They usually have bad backgrounds, pretty traumatic backgrounds. What do you think this wolf went through? Um, He grew up on the wrong side of the tracks. His parents weren't very attentive to him. His mother, old three legs. Possible head injury. (laughs) Yeah. Old three legs, which I'll probably call either old three legs or OTL from now on. Okay. But that's his name. That's what we're going to use. Old three legs. We know that his mother was a, quote, freak wolf with a bad reputation, an evil reputation. She, too, would do this. She wasn't as big, but prior to old three legs, her son, cattle, would be slain from the mother. She was an effing psychopath. (laughs) The mother, the freak wolf... Her head and fore part was that of a giant timber wolf. However, she looked more like a hyena. Hmm. Her head and chest, like I said, was of a timber wolf, but her body was of a hyena. So she may have been mixed. Her butt was tattered, survived by a single hunter's bullet. Oof. While the hind part, and from the newspaper, quote, while the while her hind part dwindled to the size of a brush wolf or coyote. How do they know it, this was his mother? Well, I'm going to tell you. That's a good question. Wolf pups at the time were worth $6 a piece. Now, this is fucked up. Back in the day. You could buy wolf pups? For hats and clothing. That's what trappers are. They would capture animals, and I guess they still do that Isn't now. it amazing how, like, animal f- Fur coats are so out of fashion, you know, like that was even. Yeah, that's a good thing. It is. My grandmother, mother and all my aunts had like beaver coats. I don't know if it was just a status symbol, but that was like a thing in like the 80s, 90s. There's an artist rendition of old three legs or at least a mother. This is it. Scary. Yeah. Wolf pups at the time were worth $6 a piece, which is about $150 in today's bounty. And there was a larger bounty placed on hyena wolves, which were a form of wolf. And that's what we think. I have never heard of a hyena wolf before. Yeah, me neither. But apparently all three legs, his mom was a hyena wolf and they fetched a higher bounty. Here's how we know his humble beginnings, because we know exactly where he came from. We know who his sisters and his brothers were. We know who the whole litter was. We know who the mother was. Was. And the reason we do that is because of a trapper who was waiting to get some wolf pups because they go for $6 a piece. He was about a mile away and he spotted a den. And in this den, the mother wolf had just birthed these wolves, old three legs being the, the runt of the litter, the young, the newest born out of eight. Dynamite Bill Foster was his name. Bill Dynamite Foster from Ponsford, Minnesota. He what a name. Is, he is watching this den of wolves waiting for the perfect opportunity for those pups to come out and he was going to trap those pups. All seven or eight of them. He was going to trap them. However, when he runs back into town, he has a story to tell. And no one believed him at the time. But after all this happened, they sure as hell believed him. Bill Dynamite Foster was watching this den day in, day out, waiting for the perfect perfect opportunity almost a mile away. Can you read from the Burlington Free Press? From the Burlington Free Press, he was waiting for the pups to be born so that he could realize an additional bounty of $6 apiece, besides the rich reward hung up for the mother's head. The next thing you're going to read is by an A.M. Thompson. He is a reporter for Field and Sport magazine. And then an unbelievable thing happened. 
Thompson wrote. The mother killed seven of the pups and with the eighth tottering unsteadily after her, trotted off into the woods and never approached the den again. But again, how do we still know that the tri- tripod is, that's the same one? The mother wolf just slaughtered seven of her babies and tried to go after the runt, but something happened and she didn't. So now this runt- This one's supposed to be the runt? Yeah, the runt. Old three legs now as the runt just watched all of his sisters and brothers get slaughtered by the own mother. And then he trots off following the mother. That's traumatic for old three legs. That's very traumatic. This is a traumatic childhood. He just watched all his brothers and sisters get eaten. Mm-hmm. What, What? you know- Is that not crazy? The surviving pup became the legend that we know as Old Three Legs. The mother spared him and for the next two years straight taught him how to hunt and slaughter. They knew this because of the mother slaughtering and then they would see these baby paw prints get bigger and bigger and bigger and all of a sudden envelop the mother's paw prints. Two years have gone by and now Old Three Legs is huge. For the last two years, he was taught by his psychopath mother on how to go and slaughter farm animals. It's amazing how like the pattern of the wolf is so similar to what we see in how like what makes a killer. You know what I mean? In upbringing and environmental factors. Yeah, that's true. Isn't that nuts? I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. Because they're not even eating the meat. They're eating deer and stuff, but they're going and slaughtering all this livestock and leaving it. They're killing for fun. The mother is teaching the son how to do this. It's like the first time this ever happened. The wolf became massive. And historians think because the wolf is getting the mother's milk. Oh, all to himself. All to himself. He has no brothers, no sisters. He's getting pumped up with all this hormone milk by the mother who is a complete complete psychopath and is killing for fun and he is just feasting. Trappers and woodsmen who recognized the familiar tracks of the mother reported the amazing growth of the pup by the size of his footprints. Nursed with a bountiful supply of milk, he soon grew into a wolf of giant size. Like silent shadows of death, A.M. Thompson writes, they would swoop down upon some unsuspecting barnyard and slaughter every living thing there for the sheer love of killing. The despairing shelters were helpless before the super cunning of the beast. For pure pleasure, they did this. The younger one became more vicious and more bolder, especially since seeing his siblings murdered. Near his two years of birth, old three legs, which had four legs at the time, obviously, he did something unspeakable, horrid, even for him, even for his mother. A homesteader, Theodore Gleasing, found the ripped remains of the mother, the freak wolf, the mother ripped to shreds by her own son and left there on a log, almost like she was crucified. He went and killed his own mother. Hanging from a branch suspended, he made an example for everyone to see. Quote, cruelly torn and ravaged by the fangs of her own offspring, the viciousness she had implanted in his heart proved her undoing some Ed Kemper shit. <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ. I mean, holy shit. So that's the background of this guy. Let's go back to Grover. The entire town knew that he was going crazy. They thought old Grover was going insane, and they were pretty right. Anyway, we last left old Three Legs when his paw was found in the trap, and he gnawed his he he gnawed himself, mm-hmm. his foot, his paw completely off. And they found the trap a little bit further away where he had went and gnawed off his own paw. That is unheard of. No no animal has done that mm-hmm. in the history. Like. I mean, show me one. That is insane, is it not? Yeah. All right. Grover, he goes into town and he goes to gather nine of the bravest men because everyone's scared shitless of this wolf. Everyone. But everyone is, they they know they need to capture this wolf because he's killing all the farm animals, everyone's livelihood. Mm -hmm. No payment needed. They just needed to kill this wolf. They needed to capture this wolf and they needed to capture old three legs and he needed the bravest men to do it. He said, I got him in a trap. And I need the bravest men. The dusty square town was bustling with unusual evening chatter when Grover Admonson rode in, his horse p- panting and foam speckled. He dismounted quickly, his intense gaze scanning the area for able men. 
Men of Ponsford, Wolf Lake, Tamarack, and the surrounding area. He bellowed, drawing attention of everyone present. I need the bravest among you. The wolf, the three-legged devil, is injured, but he ain't down. A burly blacksmith, wiping sweat from his brow, stepped forward. Grover, what's happened? Why the rush? Grover took a moment to catch his breath before he replied. He's in a trap. I managed to snare the beast, but that beast is strong. He's freed himself and is on the move again. How do you know this? Questioned a lanky man with a skeptical look. The trap's been sprung, and he chewed it from its stake. There's a trail of blood leading northward. Grover explained, urgency in his voice. A murmur ran through the crowd. Men exchanged worried glances, thinking of their own families and livestock. The old bartender, leaning on his porch, spoke up. So, what's your plan, Amundsen? At sundown we ride. With enough hounds and men, we can corner him and finish this once and for all. One by one, men started stepping forward, ready to join the cause. A young lad, no more than 17, hesitated for a moment and then said, My pa is gone, but I can use his rifle. We've lost enough to this beast already. Grover nodded, placing a reassuring hand on the boy's shoulder. Thank you, lad. We'll need every man we can get. A grizzled hunter, his face lined with years of tracking and battling wildlife, chimed in. Well then, gather your hounds. Ensure your guns are loaded and your knives are sharp. We leave when the sun touches the horizon. As the townsfolk dispersed to prepare, Grover whispered a silent prayer, hoping that his hunt would end the reign of the three-legged terror. Damn! <laughs> Some dialogue for I, us. Is this a movie? <laughs> no, but it, it should, should be. be. Oh my God, it so should be. I know. That's what I'm saying, man. You, you don't need to change anything about that dialogue. <laughs> Damn, I was like, wow, I, give me some popcorn. This is great. Gather up your hounds. Nine burly men, six ferocious dogs were gathered. They were going to ride at sundown, travel a little bit, and then set up camp. All that she's reading now is from uh, historic newspapers and the Beckersfield County where they have the exhibit. Oh, I want to see about the exhibit. Grover headed a posse of nine men and six ferocious dogs, hot on the trail of the wolf. They followed the trail until nightfall and put up with a farmer. At daybreak, they took up the chase and toward noon let the dogs loose. It was hoped that the dogs would hold the animal at bay until they could come up and kill him. Nine dogs, ferocious hounds. By late that afternoon, they begin finding those dogs one by one about one mile apart each in interval. All of those dogs, save two, were not only dead, but their throats were torn out. Their throats completely ripped open. None has been consumed. They were just dead. <sighs> Can you read the next one? Where's Stella? Me too. Mm. When they made camp at night, the remaining dogs came slinking back, whimpering and cowering in fear. Oh, <laughs> oh stop it. Don't do it. Don't. Now the dogs are out. They can't go back there. What does this do to the men? It gives a foreboding. The men are now like, oh, my God, this is the natives were right. This is some spirit that walks the earth. This is not this is not God's creation. This is a spirit from the nether realm. They believe that. And now all these hunters who cast doubt on all those beliefs are now starting to think, well, shit, maybe there's some truth to all that. I mean, look what he just did to seven of our best dogs. On day two, they left at 10 a.m. sharp, knowing that old three legs was wounded, still wounded from the, you know, the losing of his paw. He was wounded and he was weak. He probably he hadn't eaten since he hadn't eat, eaten any of the dogs. They followed cautiously in his tracks, but found nothing for that day. From the Burlington Free Press, the third night was spent on the Clemer farm. Early the next morning, they were greeted with the disheartening information that the wolf had killed and eaten a good portion of a calf during the night. They knew that fortified with fresh food and freed of its impediment, the wolf was more than a match for them. All of the hunters except Admonson dropped out of the chase. That's nuts. All besides the one who was now obsessed and insane 
with catching this wolf. Every one of them dropped out for fear. Damn. Grover Amundsen, over the next six weeks, spent tracking down this wolf. His face grew gaunt and wild, and he appeared more and more like a man obsessed. This is from A.M. Thompson. There could only be one end to such madness, Thompson wrote. Old Oscar Nesbitt, a trapper, found Admonson's body frozen stiff. He claimed that around the body he had found the tracks of the three-legged destroyer, which had come back to sniff, probably sneer, at this poor mortal who sought so long to destroy him. <laughs> wow, is this that? not insane? This is a movie. <laughs> wow. I mean, holy shit. Should you call what's his name and see if he wants to make this movie? Jesus Christ. Right? Holy shit, man. Right? This is a movie. This is a movie. All three legs came back. He knew it was his rival. That's why he came back. And he knew they would find the footprints there. What did he do? I wonder if you kill your rival who's been chasing you, who has taken a part of you, he's taken to Paul. And what do you do when you face his dead body frozen there? Like, did he did he urinate on it or did he show some sort of respect to it as a, a as an adversary, you know, an equal adversary? What did he do? We know the wolf is smart. We know he's extremely smart. So how what do you think he did to treat that? We don't know. All they saw was the the, the same prints, two in the back, one in the front. He's hobbling around Grover's body. <laughs> Damn, that's crazy. <laughs> no. What? Yeah. All right, let's oh finish this God. thing. <laughs> this is nuts. <laughs> How the F did you find this story? I don't know. Oh, my God. It's a true this story, my, man. This is like one of my favorites <laughs> that we've covered in a while, maybe. It's a true story. I know. The, the state of Minnesota was so up in arms. They were paying people to go hunt. They hired some of the trap, the best trappers from the Midwest to come to the state. None of them had success, as you'll see. All right, let's go to a couple months past Itasca State Park. At this point, all three legs had beat his rival, and he made Itasca State Park his new haunting grounds, terrorizing local, destroying calf, not eating, but slaughtering and killing them. Perhaps he knew that there was was such a high bounty on his head at this point. I don't know. $200, 3000 well, $3,000 is a, quite a lot of money for a, a wolf, <laughs> right? Two renowned native Indian trappers were called in. They spent weeks trapping three old legs, and the whole time he's slaughtering animals, they can't catch them. They were using the wisdom of the old gods, everything in their arsenal. They were the best of the best trappers in the, in the world. And they walked into town one morning with a familiar story. And and this is what they said. The animal had appeared suddenly from nowhere and stood 50 feet in front of them, grinning over his shoulder. They both fired point blank, but the wolf never budged. After they emptied their guns, the wolf vanished before their eyes. They were extremely agitated and unnerved, and no amount of money would induce them to take up the hunt again. <laughs> they fired. They, quote, emptied their guns 50 feet away as this wolf grinning over his shoulder. What were the bullets passing through him? I could just imagine him up there in his foggy and there's this fog over him and these two Native Americans who are very spiritual and they, they're just, they know this is some spirit wolf, but they they got to do this. They've got to, to take it down. They have to be the ones. They cannot go back to their tribe as failures. So they empty their guns, but the bullets they pass through are not, the, the, it says right here that the beast did not budge. He never budged 50 feet away looking at him like he wasn't even there. Dude, I mean... <laughs> Holy shit, right? The state of Minnesota then, as I said, employed hundreds, quote, hundreds of men, an army. They basically made an, own, an army to kill old three legs. And whoever brought his hide back would be handsomely rewarded. Months go by nothing. Then five deer hunters, Harry Ledoux, Frank Fred Darko, Jack Robbins, and George McCarthy. They're from Detroit Lakes, Michigan. They come down here to hunt. Mm -hmm. Like, did they know about the, the wolf? Or? They, they've heard legends. Okay. They've heard the tellings, but they're not even from here. They're just hunting here. They've, you know, they're from Michigan. They've heard little, oh, yeah, yeah, like folklore. Oh, there's a, yeah, okay, yeah, we heard about that. Okay. Whatever. They're not there to hunt the wolf. 
Got it. They're not even close to where it is. At this point, they're real far up north, but they had all heard this legend of old three legs. And how, how this works is you go out with five, four or five deer hunters. And what you do is you make kind of a big circle. Everyone makes a huge circle that spans for an acre, a couple acres, mm -hmm. you know, and then you make noise and drive the deer inward. And then you enclose the circle, you know, you, in, you trap the deer between all five of you. That's how you deer hunt in a group like that. Mm -hmm. So that's what they were doing. They weren't out looking for old three legs at all. But McCarthy was the first to spot a doe and it was going to be the first kill of the season for him. He was a very good shot. All of these guys were expert hunters. They're coming from another state to hunt. Like, I mean, you don't just do that if you're a novice. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? McCarthy spots this doe. He aims right at the dead center of the doe. And as he's looking through his scope and he is centered right on this doe's heart, he sees something in his peripheral, something that's kind of not supposed to be there. A figure. He kind of glances at it and then he sees it. He sees a three-legged wolf staring at him. So he knew what it was, exactly what it was. He sees this figure on the ridge line. It was old three legs standing tall and it was waiting for something, just sitting there. The sight of that monster on the ridge line, old three legs, spooked McCarthy and he pulled the shot. He basically missed, right? He jerked it. It missed the doe. He, and he's not one to miss. At this point, the doe goes running off. Old three legs starts to chase it. It's chasing the doe as fast as it can. And it's catching up with it. With three legs, this wolf is catching up with the doe with four legs. As I said, how it works is you would make a circle round. So further north, there was another hunting partner, Fred Darko. And once that doe started running, he started taking off right towards Fred's location, running straight at him, this doe. Quote, straight towards Darko ran the doe with the old wolf on her trail, Thompson wrote. A strong west wind was blowing, and Darko was downwind from the doe and her pursuer. Fred Darko knew what was going to happen next. He's heard the stories. He's heard of the hunters getting slaughtered. He's heard of the cows, and he's heard of the sheep getting slaughtered. He knows this is a serial killer. So he's alone at this point. Even if his other party, which is almost a mile away each, they don't have a good shot. Plus, they wouldn't shoot at that angle anyway. Like, they don't have a good shot. It's up to him. And this wolf seems like it's running. Yes, yeah, running after, after the deer. But it's also, it knows he's there. And he can feel that. <laughs> An immense fear washes over Fred, and he raised his rifle, not at the doe, but at old three legs. And he knew he had one shot in that rifle. He had other rounds, but he would he have to reload. Yeah, and yep. by the time he reloaded, it would be too late. Also, another thing was strange. He took aim at old three legs, and he noticed, shit, the deer had veered off the path, yet old three legs is still running towards me. <laughs> shit, right? <laughs> Holy shit. Gulp. Uh, uh, shit, can you imagine? Oh, shit. Oh, my God. This is crazy. I know. This is all really fucking... Uh, Oh, it's crazy. Uh, oh, my God. You have got <laughs> to call Brett after this and be like, I have got your next movie, man. This could be like the uh, cocaine bear type of I, thing. I was actually thinking this kind of reminds me of like, I didn't see the movie, but I read the book, The Revenant. Oh, I haven't seen that. We should watch it. All right. I mean, I think that's like kind of horror. I don't know what it is. It's got Leonardo in it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like the bear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, let's watch it later. All right. So, Fred, he, at this point, all three legs, the deer is gone. On. He's veered off. All three legs is running at Fred. And Fred has one bullet in that rifle. One chance. And he's heard all these stories about people shooting at this beast and it not budging. His breath slowed and he's just like... <gasps> And this beast is just snarling, just running straight at him, 50 feet away now. And his breath slowed and time slowed down. He knew he had to hit this old three legs. He knew he had to hit this wolf. Then all of a sudden, he pulls back the trigger. Bam! 
bang, crack, bang, the rifle bullet exited the barrel. And within milliseconds, the beast reacted. He knew that he was, you can't, you can't react fast enough if you're getting shot at to move. That's that matrix shit. That's not possible. But somehow he did. Fred was aiming directly for the heart, directly for the heart. And somehow this beast reacted and he twisted his body and that bullet missed the heart, but it hit him right through the neck. Wow. Less than 50 feet away, the bullet intended for his heart tears through his neck and the beast falls down. So he starts to reload. Fred, he is shaking and pissing himself at this point. No shit. Yeah. Whoa. So he cautiously walks over there. Doesn't know if the it doesn't know if he's just being messed with. Doesn't know if this is some kind of trap. The wolf leapt high in the air and turned over and over in a swirl of snow. Fred pumped another bullet into the barrel and ran over to the dying wolf. He then aimed his barrel at the wolf's head and said, Hasta la vista, Wolfie. <laughs> I'll, I'll put that last sentence. I was say, <laughs> I feel like that actually didn't happen. <laughs> but that does play well for the movie version. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so damn this is the damn this is this is the kill he is in the center so that's old three legs wow look at all the others so that were he is, slaughtered he's the size of a deer look at that neck of this doe that 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 the wolf has slaughtered prior but he is like the same size as the deer yeah he's huge that's him look he's oh, still snarling the way he's snarling kind of reminds me of Luna the way she kind of likes <laughs> she had because she can, only has one eye she does like a kind of weird yeah. weird thing with her mouth where she kind of goes like it looks like she's snarling, but she's not. That's just, it's just a kind of ugly smile. Ugly, adorable smile. Once. Is that him stuffed? Yeah. Once Terror of the North. Old three legs. Damn. <laughs> he is currently on display. I told you this is a true story. He is on display. This, this, my friends, is the uh, the wolf right here. This is it. Old three legs. That's him stuffed. So how, like, it, in reality, he's huge. How and look much at this. bigger is he from a regular? Look at this freaking paw. And look, he's got the trap. But is it that much bigger than a regular wolf? Like, yeah. in reality, it's not just a legend. Why does he have four legs? He doesn't. He's it's it, He's called three legs, but it's just his paw that he chewed off. Oh, got it, got it. Got yeah, it. yeah. It's just his paw that he chewed off. Yeah. Look at this guy. This guy, this guy has, <laughs> what is it called? Shell shock. He was so close to death. Look at this face. This isn't confidence in his face. I've seen this face a million times. This is... That's not a face of a baller? This is a face of holy shit, I almost died. Jesus. Damn! So, the old three legs is, is on exhibit. He's been there. Dying. Becker County history the legend of old three wolves it's not oh it's not a legend it's true but uh you can go see him there there she is wow he's got that three legs look at those paws man god that's him yeah he's big it's huge but i it, it I, still I, makes me a little sad i don't like animals and dying at all well i want to end with something Good news? Yeah. Okay. Sort of. Mm. This story happened the winter of 1926. Yeah. And that's when he was killed. They were chasing him. You know, the Minnesota hired all these people to chase him. During the night, they would wake up and another farmer would have lost all of his livestock. They started noticing something else about the tracks. <laughs> no, this is true. This is true. This is in the paper. L little cubby tracks? There were two back paws, one front paw, and then two sets of little paws following. So is there are there still like incredibly deadly wolves roaming around Minnesota? I don't know. They found the tracks all right, two in the front, one in the back. They also found two smaller wolves tracks along side of the huge three legs tracks. That's the story of old three legs. Damn, that was a great story. <laughs> Very good. That's a good one. I know. I love stories like this. It, I love stories like this. It's like the cocaine bear. Remember I did that one? Yeah, that was a great one. I mean, one it was too. so it's and it's so And the movie was also very entertaining. Yeah. These stories are real. Like wow. this isn't some native folklore. Like there's documented proof of all of this. These hunters were terrified. Terrified. Wow. This wolf went on a killing spree like no other animal has in history. I mean, who knows? Maybe he was a spirit and he was just killed in his 
physical form because, you know, the Native Americans at the time, they were shooting at him and the bullets, he didn't even budge. It's like he was frozen in another realm. That's crazy. My mind is more open up to this stuff since watching that show, Skinwalker Ranch. So it reminded so me a lot you of that. Think, you think it, there yeah. was something... Well, so the Native Americans knew about these things. Skinwalkers? A lo- you know, and these things take... The Skinwalkers, they talk about, take the shape of these beasts. Yeah. And you can't kill them, you know? And they're they're vicious. And they, they come between this world and another world. I don't know, man. I mean, they say this shit forever and we kind of push it push it off like, oh, that's just folklore. But then, you, you mean, we're seeing all these UAPs and stuff in real life. Like, we're seeing all this stuff, man. Like, is it really folklore or is this shit real? I mean, this story is real, but I'm saying, like, was it not just a regular wolf? Was it I don't know. Crazy. Could be. Could have been a regular wolf, but that is some crazy, crazy shit. I told you it was going to be a good story. That was a great story. I did it for you. I was hoping to cheer you up today. I know you had a bad day. That was excellent. That was so. excellent. That That's like, that might be my new story to top for a while. So we'll be here tomorrow. We will. We're doing headlines tomorrow, right? Yeah. Headlines tomorrow. Headlines. Woo! And then I'm going to finish up Richard Mirrors on Saturday. We love you too, Shram and Natasha. Thanks for being here. Martin, Desiree, Lauren. I appreciate all of you. Did I get everybody? Uh, Lauren, Shram, uh, Natasha, Martin. Okay, I just want Desiree make sure I've got everybody who, uh, who joined us. And until next time, good night, you lovely, lovely wolfies. Ow. I'm gonna run this shit.